nose and paranasal sinuses. For the nose, inspect and palpate by first checking the appearance if the nose is triangular in shape, symmetrical on both sides, and blunt. Next is the discharge, and finally the flaring of the ala nasi. Evaluate the patency of the nostril one at a time. Simply occlude the child's mouth by holding it shut, then obstruct an iris with the examiner's thumb. The examiner can hear or feel air passing out of the unobstructed nariz, and if he does, the nariz has to be patent. Nasal vestibule is pink in color with no secretion and no bleeding. Autoscope or pen light can be used. Note for nasal septum position. The deviation of the nasal septum should be straight at the midline. Also note for perforation. Inspect the nasal mucosa for pallor. The nasal mucosa should be pink in color. Also inspect for inflammation, swelling, and discharge. Paranasal sinuses, the frontal and the maxillary. Inspect and palpate by pressing up on the frontal sinuses from under the bony brows, avoiding pressure on the eyes. Then, press up on the maxillary sinuses. We can also do transillumination tests. To percuss, use direct percussion to assess the frontal sinuses. Normally, there is no tenderness on the paranasal sinuses upon palpation, and light tapping above the eyebrow should elicit no tenderness. There is no clouding of the paranasal sinuses upon transillumination test. The Physical Examination of the Mouth It is the oral cavity that includes the lips, hard palate, the bony front portion of the roof of the mouth, the soft palate, the muscular back portion of the roof of the mouth, retromolar trigone, the area behind the wisdom teeth, front two-thirds of the tongue, the gingiva or gums, the, bu the buccal mucosa, the inner lining of the lips and the cheeks, and the floor of the mouth under the tongue. Inspection of the mouth. First, inspect the patient's face for swelling. Second, look closer and ask the patient to open their mouth and inspect the oral cavity using light source. Note that if the patient has difficulty opening their mouth due to pain, it may be suggesting that the patient is experiencing lockjaw or trismus. For the lips, if the patient's mouth is open, use your light source to inspect the lips for abnormalities. For the oral mucosa, use one tongue depressor to move the tongue to either side and inspect the buccal mucosa and parotid duct. For the teeth and the gums, use two tongue depressors. For the teeth, look for the missing teeth because it may be secondary to infection or trauma and for tooth decay. For the gums, look if there is any inflammation of the gums that has a variety of causes that includes excess plaque, vitamin C deficiency, HIV, and leukemia. For the tongue, ask the patient to stick out their tongue and, in and inspect for abnormalities. For the examination of the lips, observe the color and its consistency intraorally and externally. Look for cyanosis, pallor, and kylosis. Bidigitally palpate the tissue around the lips. Check for nodules, abnormalities, mucosil, or fibroma. Observe for the oral mucosa and gingiva. Look for the possibility of canker source, which is a small shallow lesion that develop on the soft tissue in your mouth. Or look for gingivitis or periodontal diseases, which occurs because of a film of plaque or bacteria that accumulates on the teeth. Observe the teeth for dental caries or tooth loss. Observe the tongue by asking the patient to touch the tip of their tongue to the roof of their mouth and inspect the ventral surface and have the patient protrude their tongue straight out and inspect for deviation, color, texture, or masses. For the roof of the mouth, inspect for possible torus palatinus, which is bony growth, and also inspect for cancer. For the pharynx, inspect color of any exudate, presence and size of tonsils, and the symmetry of the soft palate, as the patient says, ah. Physical examination of the neck. Inspection. Inspect the baby's neck looking for midline masses, clefts, lateral neck masses, or sinuses. Look for neonatal torticollis, which is head tilt, caused by shortening of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, commonly due to a fibrous tumor over the muscle, the so-called sternomastoid tumor. Also, look for neck edema, webbing, or redundant neck skin with a low posterior hairline. Ask the older child to swallow and observe any abnormalities or masses that move with swallowing. 
Also check for fullness, mobility, suppleness, and strength. Range of movement. Note the range of movement by having the child flex, extend, rotate, and laterally turn his or her head and neck. Palpation of the neck. If masses or nodules are noted during inspection, palpate the neck and evaluate the size, shape, and qualities of nodes found. Small, firm, mobile lymph nodes may be palpable along the cervical chain. For older children, the carotid artery may also be palpated gently. The rate, rhythm, and intensity must be noted. Palpation of the thyroid gland is also commonly performed on older children and adolescents. This is the order in which nodes are palpated in older children and adolescents. You start with preauricular, followed by posterior auricular, then occipital, then tonsillar, submandibular, submental, superficial cervical, posterior cervical, deep cervical chain, then supraclavicular. Auscultation of the neck. Place the stethoscope on patient's neck and listen to breathing or dry swallow to establish baseline prior to eating or drinking. Listen to any changes while consistencies are given, for example, liquid drew to solid. For normal findings, no blowing or swishing or other sounds are heard. While for abnormal findings, a brute, a blowing, or swishing sound caused by turbulent blood flow through a narrowed vessel is indicative of occlusive arterial disease. However, if the artery is more than two-thirds occluded, a brute may not be heard. Examination of the neck includes assessment of the size and position of the anatomic structure, neck vessels, presence of head tilt, presence of masses or enlarged lymph nodes, and palpation of the thyroid gland. Here are the normal observations under inspection. Range of motion can be performed with ease. Observe for symmetry and note for deformities or any distinguishing marks. For the palpation, no sign of tenderness, pain, swelling, inflammation, or enlargement. Thyroid should not be enlarged. There is no distension in the jugular vein. And the trachea midline with no noticeable deviation. For the auscultation, no brute observed when, aus when auscultating the jugular vein.